Welcome to everyone who's joining us online. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes and we will kick off. Just to let everyone know that the session will be recorded today um, and available on the Ecologic YouTube channel as well. Okay, uh, we will start things off. So welcome everyone who's joined us online. Um, my name is Polly Goulet-Philip um, and I've got the pleasure of facilitating today's Lunch and Learn session. Uh, firstly, we'll just have an acknowledgement of country. Um, so today uh, I come to you from the beautiful or was sunny, not so sunny now, city of Nam. Um, and respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians here, um, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay respect to their elders past and present. Uh, given the topic today um, is around circularity, I think it's really important to acknowledge and recognize the indigenous populations have been caring for country and resources for thousands of years. And we have so much to learn from their rich history. So today uh, I'm really excited um, for the session and I'm joined by Rachel Lee, um, so Rachel is a highly accomplished sustainability and environmental professional. Uh, she's got over 15 years experience and she's played a pivotal role in driving innovative sustainability and environmental solutions across some of Australia's largest infrastructure projects. Um, as the sustainability and social outcomes director on the North Northeast Link Tunnels package, Spark um, DNC, Rachel is currently leading the charge on delivering unprecedented sustainability and social outcomes. So today, Rachel is going to be discussing how Spark considered circularity and the use of recycled and low carbon materials in the design phase and how this is going to be translated into tangible outcomes on the project. Before I pass over to Rachel, just a couple of housekeeping um, uh, uh, housekeeping items. So please make sure you're on mute. Um, please pop any questions uh, in the Q&A tool. Uh, we will have time at the end for questions um, and anything that we don't get to, we'll endeavour to respond to after the session as well. Okay, um, I'll ask Rach to turn on her camera and hand over to you to talk to us um, about the project. Cool. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I will just uh, share my screen. So just forgive me if I'm quiet for a minute. Um, cool, great. Thanks for having me, um, Polly and Ecologic, to talk about um, something that we've been working on over the past year or two on Spark Northeast Link. So again, I'd also like to start with an acknowledgement um, for the project. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people um, who are the traditional owners of the land on which our project stands. I'd also really like to take the time to acknowledge the amount of cultural learnings and knowledge um, that Wurundjeri elders and people have provided on the project. We've had a deep connection with Wurundjeri through our um, architect to really integrate some of the Wurundjeri stories and themes and um, cultural connection into our design. So really just take the time to acknowledge their support and continuing relationship on the project. So today um, we've got the agenda just here. So I'll give a quick overview of the project uh, for those who of you who aren't fully across Northeast Link tunneling package. I'll set some of the context 
um, for circularity um, and how it um, how we're managing it uh, for recycled materials on the project. And then I'll go into some of the challenges we had um, as part of Spark, which I know reflect a lot of projects challenges. And then I'll go through some of the tools that we've developed to help support um, the design um, for the project and go over some outcomes and lessons learned. So the Northeast Link program, for those of you who aren't aware or aren't in Melbourne, uh, basically this program is fixing a missing link between two freeways uh, running through Melbourne, the M80 and the Eastern Freeway. So this connection um, will allow some free movement from people all the way from the airport through to the Morning 10 Peninsula and lots more. So um, it will cut travel times by up to 35 minutes. There's 15,000 trucks off local roads every day. And the, the program will overall has um, approximately 10,000 new jobs being developed. So for our project, uh, we form part of one package for the Northeast Link Primary um, um, Program. So we're known as the primary package or the tunneling package that uh, work started for me uh, back in 2022 um, and we'll go through to 2028. The core part of our scope is a twin 6.5 kilometre three lane tunnel. And there's also quite a bit of uh, surface works, urban um, realm, landscaping and building some facilities to operate the tunnel and the ventilation as well. And uh, much related to this uh, discussion, we have a commitment in our contract um, to deliver 30% recycled content as part of our project, which is no small feat. If you think of a tunnel, uh, you know, most of our footprint is structural, um, structural concrete, steel and design, which can be quite challenging. So um, I'll take you through how we've approached that. Um, in the next few slides. So the program along the bottom, so we have been going for a couple of years now, we're in early 2024, and we're looking to start tunneling this year. So I thought it'd be a good part to just set the context of how we see um, embedding recycled materials or achieving increased recycled material on the project and the broader kind of context of circularity. Um, We've been looking at uh, circularity as a whole um, and recycled materials is just one part of that. So how do we kind of, as infrastructure professionals, how do we look to kind of bring that whole cycle of circularity um, into our way of thinking? Because we do have the ability to think about um, how our projects and the design of our projects and the delivery of our projects uh, look at the whole life cycle of materials. So we're in a good place to think about things in that way. Um, this project, this uh, discussion and lots of our work to date has really been on that um, loop part. So retain, refurbish and use recycled materials. So uh, the contractor's role in circularity, I think uh, there's a lot of differing opinions on uh, what a contractor should do or what a project should do. And uh, we've been doing a bit of work to kind of map out what is what is it that we as sustainability professionals on these projects do to drive circularity and increase things like the recycled material use and um, bring new, new materials into the market uh, that, that meet these circularity goals or recycled material targets. So really what we're talking about today is the design. So incorporating these thinking, incorporating requirements, incorporating opportunities into our design. But then that naturally flows through to the other stages. Um, how do we procure responsibly? How are we managing our resources on site? How are we using the, our benefit of infrastructure to kind of demonstrate leadership, not just amongst our own projects, but uh, wider throughout the building industry? and then influence or support the, the supply chain. So I really see um, as contractors in this industry, we have lots of um, touch points along that journey. Which leads me to uh, our Spark Challenge. So um, it's not like any other challenge when you start on a project, design and construct or design only or construct only, that you know the size and scale of this project is large, but there's so many requirements that sustainability professionals are required to kind of consider early days and um, 
feed that out to the dis design um, scopes of works and um, contracts and the like with our subbies. So our big challenge on this project was we had quite a bit of design packages um, ready to go. I think there's over 300 design packages on this project. And at um, one period of time, we were having three 30 plus design packages coming in on a weekly basis for the sustainability to not only be reviewing, but be across and understand the impact, um, as well as understanding the opportunities for us to early days embed um, our requirements, but also um, make sure we're, we're across what the minimum expectations are for sustainable, uh, for recycled materials in those packages. So, you know, we don't want huge teams of sustainability professionals. We want to make sure that we have a really uh, smart, efficient team that are, that are working with the designers to embed these requirements as best as possible. Um, so that's where that's where we started, and we we worked from some lessons learned that we'd actually um, I'd learnt from working a little bit with CYP and had developed um, over my time on the level crossing removal projects to bring together all of the requirements across our um, breadth of things that we have. So the contract, the Green Star, the ISCA manuals, um, and everything else that we have to consider, bringing them together so we can kind of help quickly inform and list out the requirements for each design um, scope. So what did that actually look like? Um, translating requirements into a functional format. So I'm sure many of you, if you're working on the contractor or designer side that feel that we, we go into meetings and people really want a list of the things that they have to do. And you know that's not um, an unreasonable request, but our world can be very broad. So just translating that list of requirements into a format where we can quickly and easily summarise it and hand it over to a civil design lead or a um, structural concrete uh, design lead. So that was what we thought was the primary need. And then how to understand and communicate um, what's already allowed in the standards. So when we say allowable levels of recycled content, uh, part of the challenges can often be just maximizing opportunities for recycled content within the specifications and what's already allowed. So um, communicating that to designers to really make that conversation really easy so we can talk about opportunities. And then from there, creating tools to support collaboration um, and communication between the designers and the sustainability team. So how do we do that? Um, I, th I think one of the biggest challenges is sustainability professionals and me included, we're kind of what I would call expert generalists. So we're, we're not lighting experts, we're not pavement experts, we're not um, recycled aggregate experts or structural concrete experts, but we have a good solid understanding about the opportunities across those disciplines and where we could look at and implement um, targets for recycled materials. But that's really challenging to do in a fast moving um, project environment. So getting that list of really uh, detailed and technical requirements to facilitate a designer, um, a conversation with a designer helps my team not to have to deep dive a Vic Road spec or really understand what technical requirements apply. Having a list there to kind of start that conversation is really where we've seen the benefit of this. Um, so we extracted the requirements um, into themes. So we know that there's lots of codes and um, uh, acronyms and things that come out of Green Star and ISCA. You know, we've all been talking about the MAC credits and the water credits and the recycled, um, how recycled materials fit into those. We could talk a lot in codes. So we've tried to kind of map things out into themes and the requirements are listed next to that to really help designers understand what it is we're actually talking about. Um, and then we developed some design guidance and design responses for each of those requirements. So you can see there on the screen from our tool, we've got our contract requirement, which is 30% use of recycled materials, the ISCA rating um, related credit, the Green Star credit, um, and translated that into kind of an easy to understand um, design response or design guidance to help people understand what, what does 30% recycled content actually mean for a civil design lead. 
Um, and we've provided lots of guidance on all of that to help the conversations. The designers obviously still have to understand what the what the specs and the requirements are. But um, one thing that we did was we did a lot of early collaboration and workshops with the designers and fine tuned this process to help um, come up with a way for us to work together. So we moved from a Word document and brief style kind of arrangement to this Excel spreadsheet um, uh, style doc. So we filtered by discipline. So you can filter by uh, civil or you can filter by architectural and it helps kind of summarize the requirements for each design discipline. Um, uh, Jake, Jacob Chazar, I don't know if he's online, but he was the one that kind of masterminded this Excel spreadsheet approach. And it's just been really effective in how we've managed conversations. So then they, they'll land on a list of requirements such as this uh, minimum 30% recycled materials. We have an example response to help guide what we're expecting of them in that package. And then um, we're asking and working with the designers to help help identify what are the mandatory requirements, what are the minimum expectations, so the minimum wrap content for certain asphalt mixes, for example, and uh, make sure all of that out of the way and easily done with this process, we can focus in our conversations on opportunities and initiatives and um, new, new kind of things we could look at rather than always just focusing in on hitting the minimums. Um, so one really great tool that we've developed to form part of our process is we, we knew that the ecologic guidelines were around and they were a really good way for us to understand what is possible within each different type of um, Vic Road spec and each different type of um, aspect, so pavement or asphalt or structural concrete. What we found was when we were using that for discussions with the designers, um, they were all happy about that, but translating that into design notes and things, they were still, we were still backing and forthing a lot about what that actually meant and what we wanted them to put into the design. Um, so as we were going through the process, we developed um, a translation, I, I guess, if you like, of those documents into the uh, our process. So we listed out all of the different elements you might find in a design package in, in the language that the designers use and giving them drawing notes to um, include on their drawings and within their specs. And we know that these drawing notes meet the Vic Roads minimum standards. So it's a really easy conversation and just make sure at the bare minimum, the design isn't precluding what's already available under the spec. Um, and I, I was, I was pretty surprised early days and are continuously surprised about how sometimes these drawing notes through no fault of anyone can often pre preclude minimum wrap contents, for example. Um, and that's really challenging in a construction environment because once you've got something in a design that's very black and white, you have to go through an RFI process and an approval process to get it changed. So it can prevent lots of easy opportunities with materials that are already available and accepted under a spec to get on site. So really just removing all of those barriers and hurdles as part of this process um, has been really great in helping us hit those minimums. So from that, we have developed this broad kind of process that we use these tools in. So the first step really is um, we really need the designers to read the sustainability requirements. So just like any other, um, just like any other scope of works for a design package, this is just one core part of uh, the project requirements that, that that design team might need to get across. So uh, we facilitate some upfront meetings with our design team to help filter that um, requirements list by their scope of works and generate a list of requirements. And we really need the design team and the specialists we're working with to get across those and understand what they say. And then the most important step is 
incorporating those into the design. So, you know, some of those will just be easy updating drawing notes and other things are uh, definitely more kind of challenging conversations between us and the design team and the construction team. Um, and we do a lot of communication in that space. Um, I we, we need the designers to advise, identify and investigate initiatives. So um, each design leader is the specialist in that area. So we really uh, are looking for support from the specialist to help us identify what those initiatives are and not preclude them from us considering them in procurement and construction, notwithstanding we understand that there's durability and um, other kinds of requirements that need to be considered in the design. Um, it's definitely one of the biggest challenges um, is, you know, we appreciate designers are under program and deliverable expectations and, and they're not always uh, then they haven't always been contra contracted to come and kind of back and forth and investigate opportunities for recycled materials um, within a pavement, for example. So just making sure that we're making the easy stuff easy, easy to get in and, and that valuable time with the designers we're spending as much as possible talking about opportunities and initiatives. So the next stage of the process is we've developed a specialist section in the design reports to respond to our requirements. So just populating that section in the report to make sure each requirement that we've mapped for that um, scope of works is considered and addressed. And of course, linked back into drawings and um, or modeling outputs or um, uh, minimum recycled content expectations in the drawing notes. So, um, that design report is just a summary and needs to point back to the key parts of the design which meet those requirements. And then the last section uh, where we as a sustainability team do that final review of uh, the table and the report and continue to kind of um, engage and work with the design team, but also kind of start working with the procurement and construction teams to push all those opportunities that we've uh, landed in the design. So from a results point of view, the outcomes of having a process like this is really just um, driving a culture of communication. Uh, so, you know, we need, we need as sustainability professionals to be really clear on the expectations that um, are on the project and that apply to each team and people are relying on us to do that. But our requirements can be really confusing and hard to explain at times. So just having tools that kind of help facilitate that requirements list in a way that engineers and designers can understand is been a really important part of the outcome of this project. Um, driving design de development to just include minimum recycled materials. And that sounds like an expectation, but um, it can be really challenging. There's so much designers need to get across really kind of deep diving what the drawing notes and the minimum recycled content for wraps against big road standards and stuff is potentially not something that always gets the focus. But for us, it's so important that to meet our um, project requirements, but also just to meet kind of the expectations of us as professionals in, in this industry to be pushing um, improvements all the time we need to make sure that the design hits those minimum standards and you know that stuff is just said and done and we're not um, trying to rewrite and do rfis for packages about things that are already allowable under the big road spec um, this process has really allowed us to have a greater sense of clarity and confidence about how we will meet our commitments as well so once we know that that you know some things are just locked away in the design, feeding those into the um, construction quality process. We've, we've got a lot of level of confidence that that's going to happen and those minimums are going to be met. So it helps, helps everyone on both sides. Um, so the lessons learned is these resources, these tools and processes, it doesn't eliminate the need for challenging conversations. So um, it's not just kind of a list of requirements and a process to follow and it's um, uh, set and forget and just checking tables at IFC. We really still need to have lots of conversations um, 
in the design process and we can often be facilitators of conversations between a design procurement and construction team way earlier than what they would naturally be doing it on site so um, facilitating a challenging conversation with an engineer about a piece of work that's happening in two years time to make sure that we're not precluding opportunities in the design or the procurement. So th those, those conversations can be super challenging and we're often facilitating that as sustainability people. Um, Socialising the tools for effective use. We developed this as a tool for our team to use in the background. And while we did land it and um, inform and engage early days, just the need to continuously keep socialising the tools we've developed and what they're for and how they're to be used um, has been a lesson learned because our project and other project is pretty big and people can um, move roles or change jobs or um, scopes move around. So just continuously kind of touching base about our processes and tools. And then embedding sustainability requirements into the scope of design consultants. So uh, I think I touched on it before that um, designers are there to kind of deliver against the contract and the standards and often the performance-based sustainability requirements, minimum 30% recycled material content. It's quite challenging for a designer to come in and do lots of optioneering to look at opportunities in that space if it's not part of their original scope of work. So really as an industry, how can we think about contractual arrangement with design consultants so we're both kind of mutually beneficial in that process is something that I'm continually thinking about and wondering how we're going to manage that um, moving forward. So I don't know how quickly I went through that, um, Prezo, Polly, but... Pretty pretty uh, perfect timing-wise. Thanks, Rach. Um, yeah, thank you. That was a really um, fantastic overview and, yeah, wonderful to see um, Spark taking some pretty complicated... Uh, requirements and sort of distilling that into something that um, the designers can can be using. So yeah, fantastic yeah. to see. Um, one, um, just before we jump into some, some questions, just a bit of a reminder for everyone online, um, if you do have um, any questions for Rach and the Spark team, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, we will have time to go through those um, in about five minutes or so. Um, before we jump into the q and I've just got a couple of questions for you, uh, Rach. Um, so I guess one of the things that we hear at Ecologic a lot is um, the cost barrier. Um, so, you know, the feedback mm. that recycled materials, um, you know, can have a green premium and, and be cost prohibitive. Is that something um, that Spark experienced? And I guess if so, how did you, um, how did you combat that? Um, I think... There's, I guess there's two answer, answers to that question and um, the, there is a whole bunch of opportunities that don't have a cost premium but we don't talk about it because it's not challenging in a way. Like if we've got contractual targets with or without um, performance or um, abatement money, we're always looking for those opportunities that are the same if not cheaper cost effectiveness. So... Um, like I think that leads to the myth that it's all very expensive because you just don't hear about the business as usual approaches that I think over the past 10 years uh, contractors have really uh, pushed lots of opportunities into the market for recycled materials that are the same or cheaper in terms of cost. So, um, and there's still lots of opportunities in that space. Where uh, some things are more expensive, it's definitely um, it's definitely challenging on projects to push for materials uh, that are more expensive. And when things are a slight premium on a per cubic meter rate, it might sound like not that much difference. But when you're looking at fifty thousand, a hundred thousand cubic meters, it becomes a large cost. So. Um, we've come so far but the next stage of our journey in recycled materials there are going to be things that need research and development and over the long time long term might be more cheap or cheaper to deliver on site but these businesses and these suppliers need to kind of get up and running and um, do the r d so how do we as an industry collectively support um 
paying the premiums on those, whether it's through contract performance mechanisms to pay contractors and incentivize us to fund things that are more expensive, but also kind of industry funding arrangements and, you know, collective kind of work towards uh, funding materials that we know are more expensive initially. So I don't, I don't have the answer for the cost stuff, but it's, it's really something that the majority of things, I think we can find lots of opportunities at cost effect in cost effective ways yeah and i think it's it's a little bit of that double-edged sword in that mm. you know a lot of these small suppliers obviously as they start to scale are going to become more cost competitive but to do that mm. they need you know contractors and projects to be specifying them yeah um, and it's challenging for a supplier to come in with a more expensive product to meet a target that's performance based and, you know, they are competing against products that have no recycled materials that are cheaper. And um, that's a challenging, that's a challenging industry to bring a new product into because you're competing. So I think, I think we'll more and more look at um, how do we collectively kind of support and lock in um, industry kind of material forecast to help bring confidence to suppliers and the like to bring things in because there's an appetite for it. Yeah, and I guess the, the other thing that will hopefully have some benefit is when and, and if we have a price on carbon because um, there'll be some correlation there and help to get some of those materials um, over the line. Um, okay, fantastic. We might move into the, the Q&A because um, there's a couple of questions that are coming through. Um, so the first one here we've got um, from Simon. Um, so do you see the NEL approach to design integration being scalable and easily applicable on smaller projects? Um, yes, I do. So I guess the idea when I um, started working with uh, Mia, who's on the line, and Jacob, we were such a small team, we needed something that was going to help us address a lot of work as a small team and as our team grew. But we also, and I also wanted it to be something that could be handed over to smaller projects that only had one sustainability person. So um we tried to make it something that in the long term others could use. So we, we are a big project. We've got a big team. We've had to spend time and effort developing resources and tools that we could use. But the aim for us is always to be develop these tools that we can we, we know can be scalable and support big or small projects moving forward. So the answer is yes, I think it could easily be adopted on a smaller project. Yeah, great. And I think it's worth noting that the sort of intent with this is for some of it to be shared with the ecologic team and we'll, um, you know, create something maybe a little bit more simplified, less project specific. Yeah. Um, that can obviously be shared with those people who are interested. Um, super. Okay, next question. There's actually a couple here from um, Rossio, so I might just uh, go for the first one. And I think ecologic can probably provide some answers to the second. Um, so, um, a lot of effort has gone uh, has gone into this. Um, what mm. she's interested to understand is sort of how far along the journey you are. Do you think this is, you know, really the beginning, um, or are you feeling like um, this is something that's developed over previous projects and yeah, more mature? Um, yeah, I guess the mindset and approach I've had from it, I came from the LX kind of program of works, which really is the benefit of that program is just kind of similar scopes and similar teams of people working over and over again together. So the kind of thinking of how we would approach it on Spark has definitely come from my experience. But at the same time, um, you know, this is a, is a different scope of works to LX. So um, we had, we had kind of had to develop something separate and we are, we are towards the journey of understanding the requirements and setting the minimums, but where we're still working and where there's still a lot of work to go is, you know, landing the procurement and the sourcing and the delivery of these materials. We've um, got the benefit of having some really great um, data anal analytics um, people on our team and we're using that to kind of forecast uh, recycled materials or just aggregate quantities to really understand um, the risks and the opportunities we have. So we've got lots to go on this, on this project. And then as an industry coming together, I know 
there is a lot of demand for recycled materials that are cost effective and we're all coming online needing similar materials at the same time so what's the what's the market availability to supply us these products and um, if they can't how do we kind of how do we manage that uh, when we've all got similar targets that we want to hit yeah absolutely and I think that sort of leads to the second part um, of, of Rossio's question which is around the kind of data collection um, mm. you know how are you collecting this information, the volume, location and cost and, and looking at that single source? Um, I yeah. think I, I can probably answer that a little bit from an ecologic perspective. Um, so although mm. Spark, um, the Recycled First policy doesn't apply to this package on NELP, obviously Spark um, are working with us um, and sharing some of that forecast and actual data that you're going to have to provide to the client to prove you've met your contract requirements. Mm. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the, I guess, um, the selling points within Ecologic is we are collecting all of that data and really sort of analysing that supply and demand model. Um, and as you touched on, Rach, you know, when all the NEL packages come online and with Suburban Rail Loop, there are certain materials like, you know, crushed concrete that mm. there probably won't be enough for everyone um, to use because there's just going to be such a big demand. Um, so I think, yeah, that collection of data is, is very, very important. Um, yeah, and I think data is... Um, kind of the new world for us and just having having um, a lot of those suppliers, the big suppliers, um, just connecting in with them and helping kind of um, align the reporting for things on the ground back with the data we're collecting has been a big piece of work. And um, getting quantities from design and turning it into forecasts is really challenging. So I don't yeah. think anyone's landed that imperfection yet, but we're getting there. No, it'll be really exciting to see the, the data that you're getting back when you get into um, delivery. Mm. Um, so the, the next question here, I think, is probably, again, more for the ecologic team. Um, so that's from Graham um, asking around products containing recycled content um, complying with spec. Um, but really, as suppliers, they want to be offering better carbon savings, greater recycled content that's above what's in the specifications and how, you know, how are we catering uh, for this? I think... Um, it's really great that you you noted um, in your presentation that actually there's a lot allowed within the specifications that designers are not aware of. Um, so from the analysis that Ecologic has done, you know, there's basically quite a lot of opportunity still to be using recycled materials up to the allowable limits. Um, in terms of sort of challenging those specifications, um, that's definitely work that's going on. Like there's work at a national level um, through Ausroads looking at that at the moment. Um, the sort of engineering teams within um, MRPV and, and the various project offices mm. are, are always looking at that. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's a really good point that there is still a lot we can do within the current specs. Um, yeah. And I think like one of the, and maybe it wasn't as strong as what my thinking is, I think we want to make sure that the conversations we are having with um, designers and contractors, you know, um, in partnership with suppliers at times, is really just talking about, the innovative, the new products, the things we need to do to get specialist Vic Roads approval or whatever, and embedding the minimum expectations under specs or opportunities under specs, that's just embedded in part of the process. So we don't have to spend all of our time maximising what's already allowable. We want to, as sustainability professionals, get in that design um consultant's office and go, yep, all the minimums, update your drawing notes, that's great. We're working with procurement on those. Um, here's the innovative opportunity we're looking at for this um, specific type of material. So our time together is really on innovation and opportunities and not on the nitty gritty kind of standard already allowable stuff. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, the next question we've got here, um, and I think you've answered this in part, but is just around sort of how many people were involved in developing this? Like what was the resourcing um, to set this up? Uh, you'd be surprised <laughs> <laughs> if Mia's got a like uh, uh, microphone on, she'd be laughing. But at the start, the need for us to develop this program process is because we were so small and as everyone understands that you think it's just the beginning of the project and nothing's happening, but what is happening is design. So design was well and truly underway and we were a small team. We'd literally only just met each other. 
so we worked to, together to kind of develop this tool and we had a couple of um, great grads um, um, and a cadet uh, come through our inclusive jobs program. So Lockie and Adib really helped us build the tool. So um, Naz came in as a lead leader to help implement it. But the actual tool and the process we developed as a fairly small team because we were, in fact, small. <laughs> but I can't... Um, it's just us as an industry, share a lot of knowledge. So it, it's through previous information I'd had from the industry and previous jobs. Um, yeah, that yeah. background. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we've probably got time for one or two more. Um, so the next one we've got here is from Claire um, and that is around how are you finding the link between design and procurement? Um, do you need to have your team manage this or is it happening um, organically? Hi Claire, I think I've worked with Claire before. Um, I think again, that's a that's a difficult that's a difficult one because, um, especially in a project last, like us where we have lots of design consultants and that that relationship isn't an ally. So the designers don't want to mandate things in the design that are going to increase or challenge uh, supply availability or cost. So. Um, it hasn't automatically facilitated those procurement um, conversations, but what it does allow us to, when we're going through that process with a designer as part of a design package, it flags us to then go and talk to and feed it into the procurement discussion. One of the challenging things with, a, with our procurement is we might have an initial procurement agreement that goes out to a quarry product or a recycled material supplier that's not the only agreement. They might have uh, procurement agreements with lots of suppliers, some are recycled and some aren't. So managing the engineering, planning and ordering and forecast or even way beyond procurement has um, is, is been super challenging. Yeah, I can imagine on such a huge project. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we will wrap up questions. Um, for any unanswered questions, we will endeavour to respond to those. Um, so if anyone, yeah, we'll, we'll send those round to everyone who's in attendance today. Um, but I guess, yeah, I'd like to put a really huge thank, um, thank you to Rachel and the Spark team for sharing this approach. Um, really exciting to see what you guys are doing with recycled materials and that sort of wider circularity and design piece. Um, and hopefully we will get to come back in six months and see how that's all um, faring in the construction um, phase. So yeah, thank, th thanks again, uh, Rachel thanks and the team. Me. And thanks to Mia and Viv for helping me bring all this together. The circularity part of our work is their uh, focus. So thank you for supporting. Um, okay, so just to kind of close out the session today, um, we, um, yeah, the session will be recorded. It's going to be available on the Ecologic YouTube channel. So if you missed part of the session or you want to come back in and have a, ha have a listen, um, I also encourage everyone to register. We've got um, some great lunch and learn sessions coming up over May. Um, we've got a really busy month ahead. Uh, the next one will be on Friday the 3rd, um, and that's where you'll be hearing from the Pound Road West Upgrade Project, which is one of the major roads projects um, around what it takes to trial and test new recycled products. Um, so, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, I hope that you have a great day, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you uh, in a couple of weeks' time.